Shalom family. So today I wanted to take a moment to chat about something interesting. Again, we've touched on genealogies in the Bible. These are the things we generally skip when we read the word of God as believers because, oh, that's boring. So-and-so begets, so-and-so begets, so-and-so. But in the videos I've released so far, I'm hoping to have engendered in you the realization of how rich they are with meaning how much hidden messages are in them, how absolutely beautiful they are, and that you need to read them. That there's truths and revelations and discoveries to be made in genealogies that you can't find anywhere else. I mean, I, I did an exercise once just to give you an idea, and I, I actually did it and took photos of it. It's a worthy exercise. Is I sat down and I plotted the genealogy from Genesis including the ones from the New Testament all the way through across an entire wall in my house. Every name begat so-and-so all the way through. And eventually you had this beautiful tapestry of names. And now that in itself was a worthwhile exercise to really grasp the scale. But then to stand back and look at it in various parts and start to understand things like when Noah was alive, how many of his forefathers before him were still living not just Methuselah how close did he come to the very first to the Adam section of this tree who did he see and know in his lifetime and so on who lived long how who did Enoch know and you start putting them together how old were they when their fathers died how long did they have with their fathers and then by placing these things together you start to understand the people the names in this genealogy a little bit better they start to connect with you and you start understanding their lives on a deeper scale and that just makes everything richer and better and gives you better understanding of the people that these names are pointing to so the interesting thing is the names in the genealogies generally straight through the bible are male names it's patriarchal it's always male names. It's very rare that you'll find a woman's name. Now, the interesting thing is, when you get to the New Testament, there are five women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It's not a mistake. It's not a slip up. It's not anything funny. It is purposeful and it is there for a reason. Now, we know that five in Hebrew and in biblical understanding denotes grace. And Jesus brings us grace. It is by grace that we are saved. We are living now in the very age of grace up until the rapture. So grace is important. And here we have five women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. No one too sinful, broken or tarnished to be able to receive the gift of salvation and live a new life devoted to the Lord. The woman in Jesus' genealogy demonstrate that truth because all of them you would not if you had to sit down and plan as a jewish genealogist or historian or priest you would not have included these five women if you had to include women but typically they think from an earthly perspective and again would have only included male names they would detail the fathers and the sons god doesn't work like that there's a reason Matthew chose to include the names of these women. So it is important that we take note of them and try and understand a bit more about them. So what I want to do today is I want to run through those names with you and we'll just dive deep. We'll have a look at who they are, because if they're mentioned, the five of them, don't you think it's worthy of our attention to take a moment and understand who they were? So the first one is Tamar. Now, if you haven't heard of Tamar, in the book of Genesis, we read about Tamar, who married Judah's son, Ur. Now, before Ur could ever give Tamar a son, he died due to wickedness. That's Genesis 38, verse 6 to 7. As was the custom of the Jewish people to preserve the line of the family. So his line, Tamar was given in, manage, in marriage to Ur's brother, Onan. Okay, so that's Genesis 38 8. So because he died, Onan will raise a descendant 
for the dead brother that should have had a descendant. And that's how it works. However, Onan was going, no ways, dude. He didn't want a son not counted as his own. So he did not comply with Judah's command. Eventually, Onan died as well. Genesis 38 verse 9 to 10. Although Judah promised he would give his third son, Shalah, in marriage to Tamar, this did not happen. Genesis 38 verse 11. So this poor woman, now three men already down the line, and she still hasn't received a husband and a promised offspring, a son. Judah is going back on his promise to her. He did not uphold the standard that would later be known as the Leverate Law. Deuteronomy 25 verse 5 to 10 if you want to look into that. After many years of waiting, Tamar decides enough. She's going to take these matters into her own hands. She deceives Judah into thinking she was a shrine prostitute and he impregnates her. He goes into her. Genesis 38 verse 13 to 19. So she goes off she disguises herself. She's there near the gate. She makes as if she's a shrine prostitute. And he sinfully goes into her. Judah finds out about her pregnancy. Because now obviously she can't hide this. And he immediately plans to kill her because of prostitution. Genesis 38, 24. Then she flips the table and the narrative on him. And reveals his rod that she took when he gave it to the prostitute. When he finds out that he was part of this pregnancy, he sees that he has done wrong in not keeping his promise. Genesis 38, 25 to 26. Thus, Tamar gets to live and she gives birth to twins, Perez and Zerah. They carry on the line of Judah. Genesis 38, 27 to 30. Perez becomes the carrier of of the messianic line Matthew 1 verse 3 the story as shocking as it is shows us God is working even when people choose to do wrong a woman like Tamar is an unconventional maybe even a wrong choice for God to carry the lineage of Messiah through but she is remarkable for being included in Jesus' genealogy. Even the sinful actions of humans cannot stop the Lord's plans. Now, the interesting thing for me as well with Tamar is the meaning of her name is palm tree. Now, if we just take that for a second, the meaning of Tamar's name is palm tree. We jump to John chapter 12, verse 13. Let's quickly go there. And bearing in mind that she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. I see those connections shouting at me. Tamar, in his genealogy, in his line, palm tree. And when he enters Israel, they wave palm trees, screaming Hosanna to the King of Israel. It takes us on to Rahab. Rahab, like Tamar, does not have the best reputation. Not only... Was she a Canaanite, not a Jew? So she's part of the Goyim, is what the Jews would call us, or the Goy, the nations. But many commentators argue that she was a prostitute. There's a whole discussion around, could it mean that she was an innkeeper? Could it be a prostitute? But the New Testament would lean towards prostitute. So despite her background, Rahab heard about the Lord and placed her faith in him. The people of that city had heard of the conquests of the people of Israel and the power of Yahweh, and everyone fell before them. So fear has settled over the rest of the land, including where Rahab lived, in her city. But for her, 
The experience was different. It was an awe of God and she put her faith in this mighty God who she could clearly see was real. Despite that, despite the background, when she decided to hide the Israelite spies, she told them about how she had heard and everything that God had done in bringing Israel out of Egypt. So she recounted all the stories that had been told by different people fleeing across the land and speaking about the scourge of the Israelis coming and their God, Yahweh, and everything that was being achieved. Because of that testimony, there's power in testimony. She knew that the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Joshua 2.11 the Lord your God is God in heaven above and the earth below. In other words, your God is God over all. How amazing is that? She used God's divine name, Yahweh, showing her personal faith in God. So since she hid the Israelite spies and helped them escape the city, Rahab and her family were protected during the destruction of Jericho. Scripture says that Rahab lived among the Israelites, Joshua 6 verse 24 to 25, and later she married an Israelite man named Sim no, Salmon, Salmon, sorry. And Salmon and her had a child called Boaz. Now that's interesting. So Salmon the spy, and she marries him, and together they have Boaz. And that's important. We'll come back to that. Despite her identity as a Canaanite and her background as a prostitute, she courageously chooses to identify with the Lord and his chosen people. Her decision was dangerous, but worth it, knowing the true living God. So she knew, I have this terrible past. I have this incredible sinful generation I'm living in. I still choose to be apart from that, me and my family, and we will hold on to the scarlet thread and we will put our faith in Yahweh. Now, Rahab means large or vast space, vast and large. And she is part of the Gentiles who occupy the vast space, the world, just like Jesus came. To save everyone in the world. Jew and Greek. Slave and free. All men could hear the gospel. All would be touched by Jesus Christ. All could hold on to. <clears throat> sorry. That scarlet thread. Like she held on to it. All and their families can be saved. By putting their faith and trust in Yahweh, in God, in Jesus Christ, not in self-condemnation and in a sinful past and in what comes before, but what God provides for the future, the path that he has set out ahead, not what is behind. So that brings us straight into the third person in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So Rahab Mary Salmon, and they have Boaz. We go straight into Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. Again, not a Jew. Part of the Goyim or the Goy nations. And um, she was identified with a nation of people that did not follow or worship God. However, all the men in Naomi's family died. Naomi was a Jew. Including Ruth's husband. She then decided to return to Israel. So Naomi was in this foreign land amongst this foreign people that don't serve God with her sons. And they had married the local woman and they had all died, including Ruth's husband. So Naomi was like, I'm done. I'm going back to Israel. I'm going to be where the people are my people and where we serve our God. And she sets all her girls free, her daughters-in-law, and she says, go, bless you. Have nice lives. Get on with it. I'm leaving. Ruth, however, chooses to stay with her mother-in-law and goes with her, proving 
to be a woman of faith and character. Out of all the daughters-in-law, she's the only one that says, you know what, I'm leaving everything I know behind. I'm leaving behind the life I'd lived with my husband, the places I knew, the friends I had, my own nation and culture. I'm going with you to Israel, to your place. I will stay with you. Out of love for Naomi, Ruth left her homeland and everything she knew. She says to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Ruth 1 verse 16. It's one of the most beautiful parts of scripture. It's very often used in Jewish and Christian weddings as a statement to be said because it's so powerful. And it comes from Ruth's heart. And it has a lot of meaning for us today that we should be able to speak these words. In a way, we see exhibited in the life of Ruth what Jesus calls us to do to leave everything behind and follow him Matthew 16 24 to 26 she's doing this she's leaving everything she's known Ruth further shows her love for Naomi by going out to work in the fields to collect and thresh grain Ruth 2 verse 17 to 18 the poor people could go out and glean after they had harvested and moved along as a childless widow Naomi had no means to support herself. So Ruth's work was a blessing, a salvation for her, that she didn't end up destitute and on the street. Eventually, once Naomi discovers that Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, right, and it's Boaz's land, she worked to get Ruth and Boaz together. Ruth 2 verse 20 and 3 verse 1 to 6. It's a beautiful story and how this is all orchestrated and how she brings these two together and they come together. After they're married, Ruth gives birth to Obed. So from Rahab to Boaz to Obed. Obed was the grandfather of David. Matthew 1 verse 5 to 6. Through this lineage comes Jesus, the Messiah. Her example, Ruth's example, shows that women who faithfully love and serve God are of immeasurable value. What does Ruth's name mean in Hebrew? Friend. How beautiful. Friend. And she showed that in her life, what she would do. As a faithful, godly friend. And Jesus can be your best friend. And we can learn how to be decent friends from this amazing woman in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Next woman in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. We have Bathsheba. Matthew records a surprising woman in Jesus' genealogy. He does not, unlike the others, mention her by name. <clears throat> he describes her as the mother of Solomon and the former wife of Uriah. Matthew 1 verse 6. Now we know that that is Bathsheba. From the biblical record, we know Bathsheba was married to Uriah, one of David's mighty men. 2 Samuel 11 verse 3 and 23 verse 39. What Bathsheba is most known for is King David taking advantage of her. He saw her one night while she was bathing. He brought her to the palace. 2 Samuel 11 verse 2 to 5. He then moved her husband to the front lines so that he could get killed and he could have this woman. So a complete sinful act for self that he committed and he knew he'd done wrong. David repented of his sexual misconduct and murder and God forgave him because God is graceful to us even when we honestly don't deserve it. Anyway, that's 2 Samuel 12 verse 13. Because of the unbiblical union between Bathsheba and David, their first child dies. 2 Samuel 12 verse 14 to 19. Um, later, after a time of grieving, Bathsheba 
gives birth to Solomon. 2 Samuel 12, 24 and 25. So Solomon, this amazing man in history and in the biblical record, the wisest man that ever lived, is born from this. Again, a really bad start for this woman here in this situation. And Solomon comes from that. Solomon's birth was important because he would become king after his father. David vowed to Bathsheba and to the Lord. 1 Kings 1 verse 30. Problems arise though later on in the story. And when David grows old and he does not try and prevent Odinajah from taking the throne. 1 Kings 1 verse 5 to 6. He decides he's not going to fight that and Odinajah can become king. Following the guidance of Nathan the prophet, she goes and sees Nathan the prophet. Bathsheba then goes and reminds David of the promise, the vow, the oath that he made to her in the presence of the Lord. 1 Kings 1, 15 to 21, that Solomon would become king. And because of that, Solomon becomes king. The Lord used Bathsheba to remind David of the promise he had made that Solomon would sit on the throne. He, re he reminded David through Bathsheba that you've made a vow, an oath. You need to keep it. It's important. You don't make them lightly. Now, what's the interesting thing here is Bathsheba's name in Hebrew means daughter of an oath. Again, how beautiful is that connection? The daughter of an oath was used to remind King David, even in his weakness and difficulties, of an oath he had made before God Most High that needed to be kept because it was important and it was in the line of Yeshua the Messiah, that Solomon should be king. And that all occurred because of her intervention used by God to make sure. That brings us to our final person on the list, Mary. Mary, or if you'd go more Hebrew, you'd say Miriam. The angel Gabriel tells her she would give birth to the Savior, even though she was a young girl who had not known a man, a virgin. Despite the challenges and fear this would have brought to young Mary, because it would have, she's human, she still displayed great faith in the Lord. As she says to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Luke 1, 38. She's basically been given a death sentence. You are going to be pregnant. You're not married. The locals are going to freak out and probably stone you to death. And the story, the reason I'm giving you that you're going to be pregnant, you really think they're going to believe. It, it's a fear, but she knows what she's seeing. She feels that this is real and she knows it's God. So she says, I am your servant, regardless of what my brain tells me is about to happen here. I trust in you. May everything you've said come true. That's amazing. That, that is quite a woman right there. However... In the events, she would have faced the uncertainty, the challenges, the controversy, the people looking down on her, the broken friendships that wouldn't want to be seen near her, that didn't believe any of this. She was unmarried and pregnant. Her reputation is tarnished. Not only that, but she was at risk of punishment and death. She's just trusting the Lord. And everything works out because God is in control. The world would honestly have expected Messiah, God in the flesh, to be born into a wealthy, powerful family surrounded by luxury. I guarantee you that's probably how Antichrist was born. In contrast to these expectations, mankind's thoughts, he was born in a manger to a lowly Israelite girl. God uses the weak, the lowly, the despised things of the world to fulfill his promises that he has made. The name Mary means beloved. Beloved. How beautiful is that? 
And if we jump to the Hebrew name, Miriam. Miriam means wished for child. Again, perfect connection. The whole world has wished for this child, has waited for this child. This king of kings, this lord of lords that would come and teach us and show us and walk among us and guide us back into deep relationship with God. Each of the women listed in Jesus' genealogy was not what we would expect to be in the lineage of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All these women were involved in controversy, either because of circumstances or backgrounds or other things. In choosing outcasts and outsiders, God is showing that he can use anyone to accomplish his will. Nothing can stop his plans. Not even sinful actions and choices of humans. Furthermore, the inclusion of women from other nations, such as Rahab and Ruth, illustrates that Jesus is the savior of the world. He was born into the Jewish line of Judah, to the house of David. He came to die for all people. All. No one is too sinful, too broken, too tarnished to receive the gift of salvation and live a new life devoted to the Lord. The woman in Jesus' genealogy demonstrate that truth to us beautifully. He will use anyone. You are not powerful enough to stop what God has purposed. If God has a plan and you're part of that plan, nothing you can do can stop that plan. He will complete what he started in the first place. The enemy likes to remind us constantly in life about our past. That's why we need to constantly remind him about his future. He constantly wants to remind us about our sins or bad things we've done in our lives or how we came to be where we are and maybe sin and evil were involved. We need to remind him of the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed us whiter than snow and set us free and cut off all those things from us that we are new creatures. He wants to remind you that Jesus is not for you. He's only for the Jews. But Jesus teaches and shows and proves and even in this genealogy that he has come for all men to set us free. That he is God that created everything, that spoke the worlds into existence, that formed them with his hands. The Bible literally speaks of lightning flowing over his fingertips. He is the most high. He formed you in the womb of your mother. Then already he knew you by name so i hope these five women five denoting grace in an age of grace speak to you <clears throat> and show you this amazing connection that we have to our savior god bless have a fantastic day and keep diving deep and drawing closer to Jesus every day while we wait for him to come and fetch his bride. Shalom.